Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I get to have a little bit of fun for 15 or 20 minutes. So I get to talk about technology, uh, vehicle-based technology, um, that I guess is very much on the near horizon. So I'm not talking 15 to 20 years. I'm talking about technology that is on the cusp of production or is currently in production or is in development in secret laboratories around the world. Um, so I'm going to be talking about driver state. Um, now, driver state essentially is the condition a, a driver is in uh, at any particular time. They can feel stressed, overloaded, overworked, tired, hungry, distracted, what have you. But it's really the condition or the state of the, of the driver in this case um, uh, that I'm referring to. Um, this is a very vehicle-based vehicle -based presentation and there will be some other speakers who are talking about vulnerable road users. And really it's about technology to support some of the existing um, programs uh, training, education, enforcement, infrastructure programs that are all working together to shape safe road user behaviour. So road safety strategies, as everyone in this room knows, have for a long time focused on a number of core behavioural issues. The not wearing of seatbelts, uh, managing speed, uh, drink and more recently drug driving, uh, driver fatigue or drowsy driving, and distraction and inattention uh, more recently. And when we talk about driver state, it's really the last three. It's the state of the driver being drunk, being drugged, being tired, being distracted. Now we've all seen all sorts of statistics over the years. And I guess in recent years, um, you know, whether or not you agree with these statistics from the journals that I've picked is, is, a, is a moot point. But really there are a number of epidemiological studies now, or crash-based studies, that now don't just look at the percentage of a a particular factor in a crash, but they start to look at the risk associated with particular states. These are some stats that I got from the journal Accident Analysis and Prevention for Alcohol, Driver Fatigue and Distraction. And really, I guess it's this um, calculation and estimation of risk um, that what is what Michael and the team is, is very much hoping to achieve with the ECIS project and, and apply that same approach to injury data in Victoria. So when I come to the potential role of in-vehicle technology, well, seatbelt reminder systems have, have uh, been around for a number of years and are very effective. There are a large number of research studies that look, that demonstrate that intelligent speed adaptation in field trials produces very strong effects in moderating speed behavior and particularly high-end speeds. And when we look at the driver state, um, conditions that I referred to earlier. With drink driving, um, alcohol interlocks are certainly becoming much more widespread and there's, there's been some recent reports that have showed the benefits of widespread adoption of alcohol interlocks. And there are also some very quite cheap passive sensing technologies that are very close to market. But historically drowsy driving or driver fatigue as most people may, um, may know it and driver distraction historically have been much more challenging to capture using te technological means. And there's a huge amount of effort going on worldwide um, trying to sense these states uh, reliably. And one of the reasons it's quite important to sense these states is when we start looking at some of the data emerging from the ECIS study that Michael referred to, um, the study is obviously underway, but some of the statistics that are emerging um, are up on this screen. I've picked two examples here for rural lane departure crashes you know, implicating the role of fatigue. Uh, metropolitan intersection crashes implicating a role of distraction and inattention. And in the final statistics, in the final sample, the actual statistical value may go up or may go down, but these are currently emerging as, uh, as important safety issues. And I guess one of, the, one of the great things about this project is it gives us the opportunity to drill down and look at the sorts of behaviours that are occurring prior to a vehicle leaving the road edge line or prior to a distracted driver hitting another vehicle. So just, um, just to give you a quick sense of some of the data before I start talking about technology, uh, this is an example of a typical site where one of the rural runoff road lane departure crashes would occur. Um, we should have approaching 100 of these crashes by the end of the study. The majority are in 100 kilometre per hour zones. The majority involve significant trauma. Um, about a third at the moment 
driver fatigue is implicated as a, as a definitive causal factor by, by, the, um, by the project team. And I, I guess this is a good, good opportunity to acknowledge the project team who go out and talk to people and, and go out to the sites and collect all this data. Um, Alcohol is implicated in 15% in of the crashes thus far. And really, you know, for this particular example, it was a 74-year-old 74, 74 male, it wasn't the middle of the night, it was the middle of the afternoon, uh, two o'clock, 30 minutes into his journey, he had the cruise control on, he just drifted. Going from the bottom of the screen to the top of the screen, uh, just drifted across the midline, across the oncoming lane, across the right edge line, and into the bush. And we know from the event data recorder data that we get from the vehicle as part of the study, that this particular driver impacted with the tree at 92 kilometers per hour, which is a fairly good indication that there was no active response or no control input from this driver. This driver survived remarkably, um, was seen drifting very steadily um, off, the, off the road and reported to the nurses, many of which are here, um, that he fell asleep at the wheel. And all of the data that we've collected confirm that. So this driver should have, he should have had a good night's sleep. He should have been well rested. He should have been alert. Um, he perhaps should have had something in the middle of the road that stopped him drifting to the oncoming lane. Uh, he perhaps should have had a rumble strip that vibrated him quite vigorously to wake him up, um, given that he was obviously in a deep slumber. Um, he perhaps should have had a car with cruise control that disabled itself with no steering input for two seconds. There are lots of things that should have happened. He should have pulled over if he had felt tired. None of those things happened. And these are the situations that are happening. Drivers are falling asleep at the wheel when they shouldn't. So the question uh, that's been mentioned is about where in the chain can we intervene? Just with a second case example very quickly. Um, this is a metropolitan uh, intersection crash. Uh, we're putting ourselves in the in the blue Subaru there that's traveling from the right of the screen to the left of the screen. Um, this is a case where a, you know, a young professional woman was driving to work, um, admitted to the, to the nursing team that her mind was very much on what she was doing at work, what had to be done today. Uh, she reported putting on hand cream on approach to that intersection and went through a red light and collided side on with the vehicle going on the, on the vertical road. Um, she's a professional woman, um, I'm sure she knows that uh, putting on hand cream and having eyes off the road is not a wise thing to do. But again, whether it's hand cream or picking up something up from the back seat, or I was going to say putting a CD in, but I'll be showing my age then, um, <laughs> using the MP3 player or Bluetooth. Um, you know, these are the, the everyday behaviours that do occur, even though almost everyone would acknowledge, well, I wouldn't do that. You know, that would increase my risk. Um, so these are very much behaviours that happen because we're human. So when we go back to this slide here, um, from a technology development viewpoint, uh, which is the world I now, I now live in, we're very much interested in, okay, so what's happening on the lead up to the car leaving the lane, or what's happening in the lead up to the blue Subaru uh, having a side impact? And it's really sort of looking at not only what are the behaviours, but what are the signals? You know, what are the things that are happening in the car at the time that could be captured um, and could be harnessed um, to perhaps intervene before these crashes occur. And there's huge, as I said, huge interest. Almost every automotive manufacturer is investing an awful lot of effort into uh, developing or acquiring these types of signals. And again, it's, it's the ECIS project um, which provides an incredibly valuable data source for this type of information. Just to provide a slightly different perspective, um, this is what it looks like when someone falls asleep uh, driving a truck at nearly 100 kilometres per hour. In both of these events, the driver's eyes are closed for at least 1.5 seconds. Um, this is what it looks like when someone uses a mobile phone while driving a truck at nearly 100 kilometres per hour. He could be using a phone, he could be reaching into his lunchbox, he could be reaching into the sleeper cabin to grab something. But there are all sorts of behaviours currently classified as legal or illegal that are occurring in truck cabins today. Um, we can see with the two gentlemen on the left, there are very different ways that drivers fall asleep at the wheel. The driver on the left has a very stable head and the eyes are closed for a period of time. The driver in the middle, obviously his head's wobbling around a little bit. These videos are on loop in case you're wondering, but this is dry. <laughs> 
These drivers are very good at doing the same thing every 10 seconds. Um, so this is very much the behaviours that can be captured now in vehicles, um, currently via aftermarket technology. But the car companies are exceptionally interest in, interested in putting this sort of technology in production. Um, and the reason that they're wanting to put this sort of technology in production is because like other, like other cases of in-vehicle technology, it's incredibly effective. Um, if I, there's a, there's a, a number of research studies published, including one of mine, hopefully, soon. Um, but uh, on the vertical y-axis is the rate of fatigue event, rate of fatigue events. So, so then these are events where drivers' eyes are closed for 1.5 seconds or more while the vehicle is moving. On the x-axis is weak under observation. So that's the, that's, you know, we have, a, we have a truck, a series, large number of trucks in studies for one, two, three, up to 20 weeks, or even longer, I've just cut it at 20 weeks. Um, and one of the things that we've done is we've, we've put tech, you know, monitoring technology into trucks and other people have done this as well. And we've just logged how often fatigue events occur. Um, and you know, we're currently sort of pulling this apart to inform uh, fatigue policy, which is of interest to many, including our NTC friends here who are developing national heavy vehicle uh, data frameworks. Um, but the point is that at, at a point in time, we turn on the warnings. We start warning the driver and their company um, and the rate of fatigue events plummets. The best remedy, I would always say, is a good night's sleep. But if we get to the situation where a driver is falling asleep, what do we do about it? ISA systems, seatbelt reminder systems, there are a range of in-vehicle technologies that have been shown to have very powerful effects. Um, and we and others would argue that this sort of technology um, is in that same boat. And uh, certainly the automotive manufacturers do as well. So if this sort of technology is already available and already being considered in a vehicle production process, you know, what are the other sort of technologies that might be coming online? How might they change driving? And what impact might they have on current um, crash types? What crash types might they solve? And what crash types may they, might they introduce? And from my viewpoint, what does that mean for what we sense? What does it mean for the signals that we measure from a driver moving forward? Um, so in the, in the field of driver state, there are four um, general classes of measure that both academia and industry are pursuing very vigorously to try and interpret whether a driver is tired, distracted, overloaded, stressed, or what have you. Uh, the first of those is, is measures from the vehicle, so steering inputs, braking inputs, acceleration. A lot of these are measures that are incorporated in telematics devices that are widely um, used today. Uh, the second is data from forward-facing cameras. Most new cars now will have a forward-facing camera of some sort um, with varying levels of intelligence um, that, that sense proximity to cars in front, to the lane edge, um, and some of them will start classifying uh, the particular type of object ahead. And much more recently, there are measures related to the face and the eyes, um, so where someone's looking, how, how open their eyelids are and so forth, but also other aspects of the driver's physiology, so their heart rate, um, the alcohol excretion I heard this morning, Clay, um, but all sorts of measures um, that can uh, really aim to capture more about how that individual is feeling at one particular time. And of course, the very smart algorithms uh, are multi-signal algorithms that incorporate signals from each of these. This is just another way of presenting what I just said. Uh, there are vehicles with existing technologies, lane departure systems, blind spot detection, adaptive cruise control, etc. But as I said, every car company at the moment is either fitting into production or considering very seriously, um, including driver monitoring. So the cameras and the systems that are really focused on capturing data from the driver, so looking inwards. Now these, this is terrific. Uh, it's terrific for me because I love my job and it's exciting. But this, this, t this talks to the current driving scenario and the current driver states that we currently talk about. Alcohol, drugs, distraction, drowsiness, inattention. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting just for a couple of minutes to ponder what, th what the future driver states might be. And I'm not talking next year. I'm probably talking three, four, five years time from now. This is an image, apparently, I'm told, from the 1950s as to what driving would look like around the turn of the century. Uh, it looks a bit like my son's Scalectrix um, car set, 
Um, so they, they had some things right. They had the steering wheel removed, which is what we're talking about, and they had people enjoying themselves uh, other than driving. Um, but you know, there's a lot of discussion. This sort of technology has a lot of promise to reduce crashes and injury rates. Um, and, I, and I want to be clear about that. There's also a lot of um, a lot of discussion about what does this mean for the driver in the interim, in this, in this transition period, where sometimes the driver will be driving and sometimes the driver won't be driving. Um, and so we're potentially looking at states that you know, drivers might still fall asleep at the wheel, but they might be awake and just be less engaged. And so there's a lot of effort now to measure, to focus on technologies that really look at smarter sensing. Um, this is my slightly cheeky um, little video here that, um, you know, if you're buying a car with a semi-automated function that allows you not to drive at certain times, um, well, you're, I presume you're buying that car because you want that function and you, and you want to not drive at particular times. So if, if you're driving on a long highway and you can turn it on, why wouldn't you if you bought it? Um, and so the question is, well, what happens when you need to, need to take control? Again, this is a very um, hot topic in the automotive industry. And it's actually fascinating from a driver state sensing viewpoint. I've only got a couple more, David. Um, so in the, in the sense of driver sensing, we have psychological constructs. This is the black box that Michael talked about. People's age, experience, attitudes, etc., all shape the types of risk behaviours they engage in, whether they drive at night, um, drive drunk, um, or impaired by other means. This manifests as more immediate behaviours, lane weaving, following too close, um, misjudging gaps. And there's a range of measures currently that are used to, to measure these immediate behaviours that are around the vehicle-based measures, steering and braking, et cetera. Distance to the car in front and you know, where a person um, you know, might be looking and their, their eyelid position. In an automated vehicle, or a semi, sorry, in a semi-automated vehicle, this is where sometimes you can drive and sometimes you can't, we have to change the way we interpret some of these, some of these things. Now the, the immediate behaviour of following too close it's not the driver doing that. The driver's job is now not to drive too close. The driver's job now is to, uh, if they're lucky, pay attention to the car that's driving them that it's not following too close. So the point is that the way that we interpret, the way that we capture driver state is going to change and I would argue that the importance on the person-based factors uh, becomes much more paramount. Um, so some of the applications, you can imagine if you're driving down the, the Monash Freeway um, in automated mode and you're about to turn it off. Um, if you're in this state here, the car probably has a, knows with some confidence that you're directing your attention towards the roadway. But if the car knows that you're directing your attention there, or there, or there, or not there, your eyelids, um, then you know potentially with this sort of information, the car can make a much smarter decision and could even sort of move towards the crash-proof car where the car could take over if it knows that you're not in a state. Um, I'll just go to my last slide, which is this one. Um, so if we're bringing in, a, if, a, if this is the push from the automotive industry to bring these signals into a vehicle, there are a number of other applications that they can be used for around incorporating where someone's looking with providing warnings. We should only warn drivers when we need to and not warn drivers when we don't need to. And this circle on the right is not quite the holy grail, but the integration of forward-looking cameras with inward-looking cameras is something that uh, we and many others are looking at. So on that, I will... Uh, finish up, um, I'd just like to thank um, Michael and the teams, uh, obviously a great data source. It's going to define where, uh, obviously where the academics take their interests, where the road safety practitioners take their interests, but it's also informing where industry directs money and how, do we, how we invest in these sort of vehicle technologies. Thank you. We have time for a couple of quick questions, if anyone would have a question of Michael. Raf, in the centre over here, to the right. Um, Raphael Gibetta from TARS University in New South Wales. Mike, thanks very much for presenting all of that. I was just sort of curious about if we're picking up a truck driver or a driver who's falling asleep and we know from our study that drivers are very aware they're about to fall asleep but they choose to continue to drive, that's no different to drink driving, where you know you've had too many drinks, but you choose to drive when you're drunk. Is there some way where 
we can think about a situation where we can start to turn, warn the driver that, say, in, in, in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, this vehicle will lose its power, just like you run out of petrol. Because it's really petrol, isn't it? It's energy, it's our energy and we're running out. Can we think in those terms that we can start telling drivers, hey, you're tired, pull off now? Uh, I mean, ab absolutely. And being able to t detect that someone's eyes are closed is a really good start. But, you know, lots of, the whole industry is committed to trying to move towards more predictive sensing and predictive algorithms and finding out those measures that, you know, what are the reliable measures two, three, four minutes out, five minutes out, ten minutes out that are going to, you know, potentially save someone's life but not, uh, but not go off so often that they're going to, you know, encourage drivers to, you know, tamper with systems. So, I mean, absolutely I would agree that, um, you know, that, that's a big push um, and certainly, uh, you know, in, in the data we see at the moment uh, with regard to how fatigue events are treated, you know, it's very much the involvement of a driver's employer that's really pivotal in driving some of the behaviour changes that we see. You know, the technology is great to detect the event, but it's a trigger really to start broader conversations about what are the behaviours and what are the work schedules, etc., that are driving this. But, yep, we're certainly investing a lot of effort into becoming more predictive. <laughs> uh, Mike Regan from the Australian Road Research Board. Um, Mike, what happens when you have totally autonomous vehicles and um, you, uh, you don't have a, a human driver there anymore, uh, but the vehicle itself um, might be inattentive because of a, a sense of failure or a, an algorithm failure? Um, are you going to drift into that sort of space in your company and start monitoring vehicles rather than drivers in the future? Um, I think I'll be retired by that time. Um, but no, I mean, it's, a, it's, you know, the question is, well, you know, how long is this period that we're dealing with, you know, intermediate state changes? As a concept, the fully driverless cars here now um, in Silicon Valley, um, translating that to the, the broader uh, road environment is going to take a lot of change. It's going to take a lot of roads to have lane markings based on current technology. It's going to take a lot of regulatory change and so forth. Um, what I will say, though, Mike, is that even as the driver's role becomes diminished in and, and almost removed with self-driving cars, there are lots of other things that you can use sensing technology for and uh, perhaps they move more into a convenience realm around driver identity, driver preferences uh, and so forth. Um, so thanks, Mike. Thanks very much, Mike. Please join me once again thanking Mike Leno.